John Walter back uh, to campus again. I'm not going to do the introduction today, but I'm going to um, hand it over to another John who worked uh, very, very closely with John Walter. So um, I've done my bit. So welcome, thank you. and and thank you, and uh, welcome all. John, who's going to do the introductions? Thanks, Brian. I'm delighted to welcome John, particularly when he just asked me the question how I got out of bed this morning and forgot to change my pajama shirt. That's a good question. It was a very, as we say in research, it was a very fertile generative question. The question is, how do you answer it? You want to put a shirt on. Anyhow, on a serious note, it's a, a real pleasure to be asked to introduce John. Um, I first met John uh, across an interview table, actually, when Flinders University had moved through the process of formally uh, partnering with the CRC for Remote Economic Participation. And uh, fundamentally what we were doing is searching for a researcher and a person of significance and capacity, empathy, uh, to work in the field uh, with the CRC, Remote Economic Participation, and particularly to head up the strand, or if you like, the major focus within the CRC's funding around remote education systems. And uh, long story short, uh, John was selected. And it's been a, a real privilege for me, and I think many others, to work with John, uh, because he represents a, a site, if you like, or a person of um, both significance and centeredness and calmness, but also great innovation and optimism and capacity to endure, but also to highly respect uh, those whom he works with. And way back when that interview commenced, because uh, of my limited capacity, it kind of confused me a bit as to how this all might transpire. But here we are today, to see some of the work that John has been able to do and with a number of people in this room and elsewhere. So, uh, and John, by the way, is um, an adjunct of Flinders University uh, and we are working together uh, from time to time on things together. So John, uh, great to have you with us and we uh, really look forward to your presentation today and we fully forgive you for your remarks on the uh, closing. <laughs> Uh, thanks, John. Um, I know we had a response to have you It might be a good opportunity to uh, turn off our mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the off button. <laughs> John, I'm actually on payroll, so uh, I'm not just just an adjunct. Oh no, no, sorry, uh, sorry, you are. I'm not uh, <laughs> physically here all the time. I, uh, I, I and I'm at the other end of the country. You know, it's uh, a real privilege to be part of the, the Flinders School of Education and um, to be here today to uh, give this what we're calling a lecture. Um, but uh, really it's a, a bit of a talk about some of the findings and some of the thinking that's, that's gone on in our project, the Remote Education Systems Project. Uh, likewise, it's been a great privilege to work with you, John, to uh, have that opportunity to sort of share together. Uh, before I commence, though, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, traditional owners that we, uh, that, that um, are, uh, have been part of this land and, and belong to this land, uh, the Ghana people, uh, for millennia, uh, and acknowledge their contribution to learning uh, over the, the time that they've uh, been part of this land. So the topic for today that I've got is, uh, is titled The Advantaged and Disadvantaged of Very Remote Schools. This is the, the second in a series of lectures based on findings from the Quality Research Centre's Remote Education Systems Project. Remote Education Systems team's intent in delivering these lectures is to inform our stakeholders so the findings can be turned into something useful to, to and influence the way that people think and respond to remote education, particularly for those students who come from remote communities. And in particular, those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in the back And before I go any further, I'd like, also like to acknowledge some of the team uh, that, are, that are here, both uh, Sam Osborne, who's uh, a colleague of mine uh, from UDSA, 
and some of the students of the Cop Tessa uh, and Phil, Phil has got yeah, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Julian, um, both of you here too. The focus of today's uh, lecture is on educational disadvantage. When we, that is those who come from a Western experience and position, talk about educational disadvantage, it's sometimes assumed to be a given in remote contexts. What this lecture will do is challenge those assumptions and expose the basis of our beliefs about what it means to be advantaged or disadvantaged. Along the way, I'll share some of our findings as they relate to this particular topic. At the end, I want to get to a position that allows us to consider just who is disadvantaged in remote education. And this will probably leave a lot of questions hanging about how schools should respond, but I think I'll leave that discussion to a separate lecture, but there will be opportunity for questions at the end as well. We've got four research questions that have driven our research project from the very beginning. We've collected qualitative data from uh, a range of sources, and we've examined this qualitative data, which I'll go into in a bit of detail later on, um, to see what sort of responses we get to these questions. So the, the four questions that underpin our research are, one, what is education in, in remote Australia for, and what can or should it achieve? Two, and what defines successful educational outcomes from the remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander standpoint? Thirdly, how does teaching need to change in order to achieve that success as it was defined by that standpoint? And fourthly, what would an education, effective education system in remote Australia look like? Our methodology is built on assumptions that in the complex and contested space of remote Indigenous communities, Research should, first of all, reflect the primacy of local ontologies, epistemologies, and axiologies. Acknowledge the power and position dynamics of outsiders working inside remote communities. Recognise the humanity that's shared between researchers and the research. Co-generate new knowledge that isn't necessarily black or white. And finally, be transformative and powerful for those that we work with. Yeah, just some, some assumptions that we are working within. So a little bit about our data sources. Uh, we've, we've collected data now for three and a bit years, um, and we've used a, 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 a mixture of sources. Uh, some of them are quantitative sources, like the publicly available data sets from my school and from the census. Uh, we've uh, done a number of community surveys, particularly in the tri-state region of, around uh, the desert of uh, South Australia, Western Australia and Northern Turkey. We've um, conducted our own observations in three jurisdictions. We've engaged over 200 remote education stakeholders, and some of you are here today, that were part of what we call thinking outside the tank. <coughs> Uh, we've used uh, Dare to Lead snapshots, uh, many thanks to Principles Australia Institute for their work with us uh, on that due. In 31 very remote schools, uh, and of course we've read lots of relevant literature, and we've got six postgraduate research projects uh, in progress uh, on a range of different topics uh, that include um, successful space completions uh, that uh, Julian is doing. Uh, the use of technology for pre-service teachers that Philip's doing. Um, and stuff around um, health and well-being, uh, school readiness, um, culturally inclusive curriculum, and uh, a few others as well. Our boarding schools are the one I should forget as well. So the qualitative data that I'm going to refer to in this lecture uh, is drawn from our observations, the thinking outside the tank sessions, as well as the, uh, the collegial snapshots surveys that uh, were analysed uh, from Dare to Lead uh, the Principles of Trade Institute. Before I discuss the relevant literature, I think it might be useful first of all for us to understand the context I'm talking about. There are hundreds of uh, communities dotted around uh, northern and indeed remote Australia. And this map shows their geographical locations in the, in the red dots. Uh, all of the very 
all of the light coloured uh, area, uh, so the light yellow coloured area, is considered to be very remote by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. What this map doesn't show, though, is the diversity that those little dots represent. The dozens of languages that are spoken in those places. The country which belongs to those people, which is extraordinary, and the cultures of those peoples who belong to those places, which are, which are very rich, ancient, and quite different from the cultures that are represented in non-remote parts of Australia. They aren't simply dots on a map. They aren't just uh, names of communities. One of the important things to consider for us who live in uh, other parts of Australia is that that when if I live in one of those little places, it's not me that's remote. It's the capital cities around the outside of Australia that are remote. And we sometimes forget that. some of our research findings, I'd like to briefly outline some of the literature that's of relevance. And I'll start uh, with a summary of how disadvantage is described or represented, not from a theoretical perspective, but largely from the perspectives of those who articulate views about disadvantage, perhaps uncritically. I'm resisting the urge to make a, a comment on this from any number of theoretical or philosophical approaches or perspectives, though I do acknowledge that holding a particular theoretical or philosophical position does shape to some extent how we might respond to concepts of disadvantage, deficits and gaps. Here I don't want to single out particular groups. Rather, I just suggest that many com commentators, including academics, uh, commentators on remote education, take the concept of disadvantage as a given, not as something that should be thought through or contested. I'll talk a little bit about the policy response to this disadvantage uh, a little bit later on before I, I unpack uh, what some of the foundations of educational advantage in Australia are. But one of the predominant themes that pervades much of the literature on remote education is one about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander disadvantage. The intent of that word is perhaps to convey a sense of disparity between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and non-Indigenous people on a range of indicators. And you only have to look at the overcoming Indigenous disadvantage reports that come out every two years through the Productivity Commission to, to see the number of indicators that report a disadvantage uh, when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are compared with others. Disadvantage has been defined specifically as the difference uh, in outcomes for Indigenous Australians when compared with non-Indigenous Australians. It becomes a concept that extends to closing the gap. Um, and we only need to listen to the Prime Minister, the Council of Australian Governments and others to, to hear those words. Uh, closing the gap in a general sense and in a more specific educational context. Educational disadvantage is one of several domains where disadvantage apparently occurs. I think it's important to note that this talk of closing gaps is not unique to Australia. It occurs in other countries where minorities exist, not just Indigenous minorities. And there can't be any denial of the data itself and the practical consequences that are behind the labels of deficit and disadvantage. But there are problems with the pervasive rhetoric of disadvantage. First, there's a real risk that labelling people as disadvantaged if you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, Torres Strait Islander is the disadvantage itself. So to be disadvantaged then becomes being an Indigenous person. Uh, in effect, uh, uh, being an Indigenous then is some kind of racial or as Cowishaw says, cultural dysfunction. Second, the deficit discourse, discourse is most frequently based on non-Indigenous understandings of advantage. 
developing a sense of the Aboriginal problem, as if to say non-Indigenous people don't have a problem. Third, the racialised nature of disadvantage may lead to accommodation of responses that lead to exceptionalism. And Marcel Engton uh, has uh, used this term. Um, that is an exceptionalist view that comes with race categorisations, se segregates and therefore discriminates against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Fourthly, the disadvantaged discourse may idealise the interests of the privileged, reinforcing the hegemony that in turn reinforces existing power dynamics in society and results in self-fulfilling prophecies of disadvantaged people. Then the design of remedial interventions which are meant to fix the deficits just reinforce a narrow view of what a good education or what a good life is all about. Furthermore, the stereotyping of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as, as homogenous populations rather than a diverse mix of peoples, uh, and Tim Rouse is particularly good on this particular topic, tends to result in false binaries along racial lines, indigenous versus non-indigenous. And in the process, indicators used to describe culture end up describing disparity rather than the aspects that are considered of value within the culture being described. Now later on, I'm happy to give some examples of what I mean by that, uh, if you ask. The data reported at a national level in Australia do support the view that remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders perform below the standards achieved by non-remote students. The performance gap or deficit is evident in any number of measures including academic achievement as measured by NAPLAN, school attendance, retention to year 12, transition into further education or university, uh, or into employment. Once again, you only have to have a look at the overcoming disadvantage reports to see how those gaps aren't necessarily closing. National approaches don't necessarily target remote schools, but the schools with the most disadvantaged, according to those de definitions, um, tend to be those schools in remote places. And more specifically, those schools with high proportions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. <coughs> In, uh, in 2012, uh, a national education agreement was uh, formed through the Council of Australian Government, which had as its goals uh, a number of points to uh, attract and train and develop quality teachers, to implement a national curriculum, to enable greater transparency and accountability uh, in the education system to raise parental and community expectations, to support teaching and learning, to review funding arrangements, uh, to uh, provide support to students with additional needs and to close the gap in educational outcomes. And it doesn't take too much, I think I can go back to the slide now, to see the outworking of the National Education Agreement in the policy responses that have come as a result. Of, the, uh, of, of both the Melbourne Declaration on the Educational Goals for Young Australians and the subsequent um, uh, National Education Agreement. So, so coming from that uh, Melbourne Declaration, we saw the National Education Agreement. There's also been a reform agreement that's come since then. And these are just some of the federally funded initiatives that have arisen to address disadvantage, particularly among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, not just in remote schools, but they've been, uh, the, the funding that's been allocated to these particular initiatives uh, amounts to the billions of dollars. And so we've seen national partnership agreements. We've seen the My School website established. We've seen uh, a national curriculum introduced. We've seen the Gonski reforms rebadged under the Education Australia Act. We've seen national teacher professional standards in remote places. Uh, they've tried a school enrolment attendance measure. We've had the more Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander teachers initiatives. We've had national, uh, the National Alliance for Remote Indigenous Schools. We've had direct instruction, or we're having direct instruction and explicit direct instruction. We've had the strongest and smarter institute. We've got the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation. And uh, one of the, the most significant uh, initiatives 
uh, to come into uh, remote Australia is the remote school attendance strategy. Now most of these initiatives have actually come and gone. But I would ask, have they actually worked? <coughs> Has there been a change as a result of those initiatives? And it's actually quite difficult to find anything that answers that question about, did it really work? Um, and that's a little bit surprising to me, given the billions of dollars, and I mean billions of dollars, that have been spent on these initiatives. Surely we would want to see some evidence that these initiatives have worked. Uh, it's been a huge commitment to action, you could say. It may be worth stopping for a moment to consider what our ideas of an advantaged education come from, or where they come from. I won't cover this in any depth, but you can read about it in some of our other published work on this particular topic. But for now I'd like to suggest that there are five rationales that drive an advantaged education in Australia. Firstly, there's a, a, a sociological or a societal rationale for education. Education has been seen as a vehicle for social control and for the promotion of citizenship. The kind of socialising role of education may have the tendency to ignore what Lewis Mole has described as minor, minority groups' funds of knowledge. However, others have described education as transformative and emancipatory. And if you read the work of uh, Paulo Ferreira and Jeannie Oakes, you'll see uh, that coming through in that. Education, too, is, is seen as a process that builds social capital, and I'm thinking here of James Coleman. And uh, it's also a product of cultural capital, and I'm thinking here of Bourdieu, Europe, which in turn maintains class divisions. So in that mixed bag of uh, rationales, there are some sociological and societal rationales. But there's also a developmental rationale for education. The international discourse around education and development suggests that education leads to increased levels of development and social equity, and that the hope of education is that it leads to a better life, particularly for those living at the margins of society. Leadbeater, uh, in his 2012 work, suggests that education offers them, those at the margin, I hope that their place in society will be not fixed by the place that they were born, and that through education people can remake their lives. Now, of course, for those whose identity is largely shaped by the place that they were born, it may raise questions about why you would want to remake your life, particularly a relevance for remote Aboriginal people. There's also a knowledge and skills rationale for education. There's a view that, that knowledge is an end in itself, that one of the primary aims of education is epistemic. And that for educators it's reasonable to expect that it is possible and desirable for people to know and do things and to engage in and take seriously the fruits of rational inquiry, where such inquiry is understood to involve the pursuit of truth. Next there is an individual or economic rationale for education. The argument of liberalist education philosophers suggests that schools should encourage competition between individual students and prepare students to live independent lives in society, respecting their uniqueness and distinct capabilities. Individualism is also reflected in the economic theories of Adam Smith, which in turn is reflected in what could be described as free market capitalism. Gary Becker's 1964 work on human capital brought together those ideas of investment in education <coughs> and distribution of income on the basis of, basis of educational attainment. Finally, there's a historical basis, or an historical basis for education. Current models of education are not that far from those, uh, not far removed from those of the 19th century. Uh, and in an interesting examination of Australian schooling by Campbell and Proctor in uh, last year, uh, they reveal a number of features that have changed only little since the mid-19th century. And it's true that the breadth of education may have changed uh, a lot and the scope of schooling has expanded, but the fundamentals of teachers teaching in classrooms hasn't. Between 1872 and 1893, all Australian colonies had departments of education. By 1900, school attendance was compulsory. 
and the teaching of the profession was well established and curricula were well developed. Now, of course, the same cannot be said for education in remote communities. In many cases, those communities weren't even formed or in place until the 1960s, 70s, or even 80s. And school buildings weren't even part of the, uh, the landscape of those communities, perhaps until later on. Our analysis of some of the data that's available suggests that the longer the history of schooling in the community, the more likely the patterns of attendance and achievement will mirror those of non-remote schools. The point of that discussion about uh, the, the different rationales of education is that the more your personal um, identity, values, beliefs, and social norms, knowledge systems, economic systems, and expectations of what is important and align with those of the system, the more likely you will succeed in the system. I guess this, this representation, which, we, which I've adapted from an earlier piece of work that we did, uh, is an attempt to, uh, I guess, diagrammatise uh, those rationales for a good education in Australia generally. But you can be disadvantaged by the system if you want to uh, succeed in the system when your ways of knowing, being and valuing don't align mm -hmm. with what the system says. Of course, it's never as simple as a simple diagram suggests. But well, I now want to turn to some of the data that we've got that uh, talks about disadvantage and advantage. In our examination of qualitative data from the various sources I mentioned earlier, we looked at clues, looked for clues that might show how respondents saw disadvantage. And you'll see in this presentation of data, if you look closely, uh, that uh, we have separated out those who provide a remote Aboriginal voice from the rest. Uh, you'll see a couple of columns there towards the right-hand side that uh, show remote Aboriginal references. And the reason we've done this is to ensure that we answer the question um, <coughs> we had about the remote Aboriginal standpoint. I should say that uh, in our data, um, that we've examined for this, even though our question said that we were talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think we have any Torres Strait Islanders in that particular data set. Although other students that we're working with are looking at the Torres Strait Islanders as well. So the table on this slide summarises the number of sources, references and participants who discuss issues associated with disadvantage. What the data shows is this. First, that disadvantage hardly rates a mention as a term in itself. And among remote Aboriginal respondents, it does not rate at all. So you look at that, that, that top row there, references to disadvantage, to zero. Second, when we look for related concepts such as poverty, discrimination, racism, access and equity, we can see that these concerns do prompt some comments predominantly from non-remote respondents, but primarily as a reaction to the need for a system response. But when you look at uh, those uh, system response <laughs> issues, um, it's not a huge number of responses that we've got there. However, rather than uh, talk about disadvantage in those terms, more respondents talked about the nature of the context and the complexity within it. And this was a, a theme that cut across all of our data. If we look at the second last row right here, uh, context and complexity. We found that a lot of people were talking about this as an issue rather than describing it as disadvantage. Further, there was broad recognition in about a quarter of all of our sources that the health and well-being of children both contributed to learning outcomes and needs to be taken into consideration if teachers are going to teach successfully. We could describe that as disadvantage, but really it's part of that overall picture of uh, complexity in the context that we are dealing with. So if disadvantage wasn't an issue, perhaps we should be looking for where advantage lies in education instead. 
And of course, part of the reason for the lack of response on issues of disadvantage relates to the way we ask questions. We didn't specifically ask people about what they thought of educational disadvantage. Nevertheless, if it had been a major concern, the opportunity to comment on it was certainly provided in discussions about how the system should respond. And there was opportunity for, for respondents to discuss this in terms of what education is for in remote Australia. They could have said it was about overcoming disadvantage, poverty, closing gaps, improving living standards, but they didn't. And this table summarises the responses given for the question about what education is for. Remember again, the data comes from a variety of sources. Um, the question uh, about uh, what education is for could also be interpreted as one that asks where is advantage in education for remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. And in contrast to the table I first showed, the number of responses given here is much greater. Note again that we've separated out the remote Aboriginal voice from other voices. And uh, in the right hand side there, I've got a, a, a column labelled Pike Squared. Uh, we did some analysis on uh, the, the difference between um, the non remote and remote voices. Uh, and uh, the ones that have got numbers in them show that there was a difference in issues around language and culture employment and economic participation and choice and opportunity. But the largest number of references were coded at language, land and culture. In abridged terms, this is about maintaining strong links to local language, kinship, kinship and stories. This view of education was articulated more strongly by remote Aboriginal people. The second issue of importance to respondents related to identity. There was frequent overlap between the, uh, the language, land and culture and identity themes, but the point of distinction was, in terms of identity, the, the importance of belonging, in the individuals knowing who they are, being confident and strong in spirit. The third response, this is in order of importance of course here, to the question what's education for related to employment and economic participation. The importance of education leading to jobs. The proportion of non-remote responses here was significantly higher than for Aboriginal responses in remote communities. A fourth issue raised uh, by many respondents was described as being strong in both worlds. That is, respondents felt the need for young people uh, to learn how to engage within their own culture and be confident in engaging with Western cultures knowing what was appropriate in both cultures. A fifth advantage of education was that it allowed for meaningful engagement in the world. In other words, it should be about helping students learn to live in the world, being able to deal with the realities of life and community, building cultural capacity to deal with the environments they find themselves in, engaging in relevant learning, enabling them to be productive and broadening their horizons, persuading <coughs> the things there. And a sixth purpose of education given was about providing choice and opportunity, and here uh, the non-remote voices came out more strongly. And I could go on, there was a range of other purposes that were offered by respondents, including the need for schools to prepare future leaders in communities, to be, to be socialised to the norms of schooling, to offer pathways to further learning and to empower learners. The point to take away from this table is that according to our respondents, there are many advantages of engaging in education for remote learners. However, they are not about overcoming disadvantage, closing gaps, or addressing poverty. The literature I cited earlier talks about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander disadvantage. The labelling of disadvantage is based on non-remote, non-Indigenous indicators of success and advantage. And I'd like you to hold in your mind the qualitative findings that I presented in the previous slides. But to explain this a little bit further in terms of just who is advantaged and who is disadvantaged, I'd like to just draw on initially some of my school data. So 
in response to the question, are students disadvantaged? We didn't ask students directly uh, about their views. However, one thing we do know from our research is <coughs> attendance rates and retention to through to year 12 and then transition to employment and further, higher, further or higher education are relatively lower uh, than they are for non-Indigenous students, whether they are from remote communities or not. And this slide here shows attendance rates in very remote schools with both uh, uh, up to 80% Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and above. And what we see is that despite the significant investment that you, you would have uh, seen in that one of those earlier slides, Nothing has really changed in the seven years that my school has been uh, showing data from uh, the schools in, across Australia. So in 2008, the attendance rate for uh, remote schools with mainly Aboriginal students was 69%. And in 2014, guess what? It's 69%. <laughs> Does this in itself indicate or constitute a disadvantage? Our research respondents suggest that in the case of very remote schools, this is rather a reflection of young people's choices to engage or not to engage. It may just reflect the extent to which students in remote communities see some advantage in what schools have to offer. So I don't look at this and say, well, there, that's an indication of disadvantage. I see that as an indication of students' choices to engage in a system and to take up what it has to offer. What about parents? So if students aren't disadvantaged, are remote parents disadvantaged by education that is on offer in schools? The deficit discourse discussed earlier would lead many to believe that parents are being shortchanged by schools. Indeed, when we look through the lens of what education is for, which is what this slide does, uh, and apply an, an employment and economic participation filter, which is the top row of uh, bubbles there, uh, the yellow ones, we see some strong indications of what success would look like and how the system might respond, but we don't see too much in the way of how successful teaching might achieve the end of employment and economic participation. And if you think that if that's the goal of education and this is how schools should respond, then what you see there is a very limited view, a very small view of how schools can respond to the issues around achieving employment and education, uh, employment and economic participation. By contrast, when we look through the identity filter or the language, land and culture filters, what we see are a range or is a range of um, other um, indications of what success looks like how the system should respond, and also how schools should respond in order to achieve those goals for an education in remote uh, Australia. So in short, parents are disadvantaged, not because of their socioeconomic background, which makes up the ICSIA, or the Index for Community Socioeconomic Advantage Score that you see in my school, but because schools are not well equipped to effectively support students make a transition into employment, even though, as the literature suggests, that is exactly what schools in Australia are for. I'd also ask, are non-local educators and leaders disadvantaged? We don't often talk about this, but what about non-local educators and leaders? Are they disadvantaged? Non-local educators and leaders are at a distinct disadvantage, both compared to their local colleagues and their non-remote colleagues who teach or lead in non-remote schools. Non-local respondents, while not describing this as a disadvantage, talked about the importance of local language teachers, of ESL skills, the need to be contextually responsive, 
all of which you can see if you, you look closely at these clusters of responses here, are really important for non-locals. But if you ask the same questions of uh, leaders in urban schools, of teachers in urban schools, my guess is that most of these things you would not write a mention. Why do they write a mention in a remote context? It's because leaders and teachers themselves see themselves at a disadvantage. They see their, their own deficits. The apparent privilege that non-remote educators bring to schools counts for very little in a remote community. It may even be a hindrance. What about local Aboriginal educations, uh, uh, educators? Are they advantaged or disadvantaged? Our qualitative data published elsewhere shows that for remote Aboriginal participants, having local language educators in schools is critically important. <coughs> Our analysis of my school data over seven years shows that the higher the ratio of non-teaching staff to teaching staff, which is what this slide shows, the higher the attendance rate in schools. The ratio, according to the correlation shown in this slide, explains some 34% of the difference in attendance rates of schools. There's more to that slide than uh, that uh, particular uh, story tell, but um, let's just run with that for the moment. Now, at the same time, in 2014, Nearly one in four very remote schools, with more than 80% Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students, employed either zero or just one non-teaching staff, let alone local language educators. Our analysis also suggests that local educators and support staff have a critical role working with families, dealing with teasing and translating and interpreting for teachers who do not know the local language. In schools uh, that um, don't have local language people employed, whether as teachers or not, uh, clearly communities are disadvantaged by the lack of those people in the schools. What about employers? Are they disadvantaged? Employers should be one of the key beneficiaries of a good education system. Yet our research shows fairly clearly that remote employers in mining, agriculture, retail and construction industries, where the so-called real jobs are, by and large are choosing not to or are able to engage local people from remote communities in the work that is available. Again, our research suggests that personal agency is a factor contributing to the lack of employment uptake in these industries. Despite the recognition in our data that schools should be about preparing young people for work, there is a disconnect between what schools actually do and what employers need. Finally, I'd like to ask the question, are school systems disadvantaged? The strategic policy focus on remote education over recent years points to a level of frustration among politicians and bureaucrats due to the apparent lack of response to education programs and initiatives. The slide there about uh, the, the lack of change in attendance rates is an indication of that frustration. Programs are rolled out with fanfare and later quietly withdrawn until the next magic bullet is introduced to fix the intuitable problem of remote education. You only have to look at the Northern Territory Review of Indigenous Education conducted by Bruce Wilson last year to see evidence of that. The education system is often described in hegemonic terms, as if it held great power over those it covers through various acts, education acts that is, ministers and statutory bodies. And the irony is that despite the threats to withdraw welfare payments, for example, through the school enrolment and attendance measure, and the carrot of an apparently better life, change is elusive. The hegemony has seemingly little influence over students who are refusing to buy into the so-called good life. Our take on this is that the system needs help to overcome its own deficits or disadvantages in this regard. In summary, what I've tried to show in this lecture is that the concept of disadvantage as it is applied to people in remote communities is fundamentally flawed. 
remote education systems project data shows not only do people from remote communities fail to mention the concept, but the descriptors of disadvantage in terms of poverty, deficits and gaps are constructed externally based on a set of philosophical, economical, economic, historical, social and psychological assumptions that come from somewhere else, certainly not from the remote community context. I argue that if students in remote communities saw advantage in engaging in the education, then they would be demanding more of the education system. But they are not, except perhaps for those whose parents and families do aspire to what the education system offers. I've also shown that above and beyond employment and economic participation, remote Aboriginal participants in our research see the purpose of education, that is the advantage, being for maintaining connections to culture, land and language, and to reinforce and strengthen their identities. They want to be strong in both worlds, as they see the Western world with the system stand in contrast to the real world of their country. Our respondents articulated clear pathways to achieving these advantages through successful teaching in schools. They couldn't do the same for the goals of employment and economic participation. Those who develop policies for remote schools often do not bear these non-negotiables of land, language and culture and identity in mind. They may think they hold the keys of advantage and therefore expect a favourable response to their good intentions. But I contend that it is not students in remote communities who are disadvantaged, at least in their own mind. Rather, it is first and foremost education systems that are disadvantaged. After all, nothing they have tried so far has worked particularly well in achieving or affecting the kind of rapid change expected from remote communities. Unfortunately, as a result of their failures, parents, employers, local and non-local educators are all shortchanged in the process. And while we haven't had time in this lecture to unpack what we see as some of the answers, and the data certainly does shed, shed light on those answers, we first need to find a new language to talk about schools in remote communities. A language of contextual complexity is perhaps more appropriate than a language of disadvantage, deficit and gaps, as we collectively attempt to find paths that satisfy the expectations and aspirations first for people in remote communities, but also for teachers, employers, school leaders, political leaders, and bureaucrats. And I don't think that those aspirations are mutually exclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for that very uh, thought-provoking and challenging presentation. What we normally do in uh, the session from here is that we open up for uh, for questions, and I think we'll proceed with that in that normal way. We have approximately five minutes to do that. I'll uh, I'll be the channel for the questions at least initially, unless the process overtakes me, and I will retreat and sit down. But so uh, yes, questions, comments, please. Thank you. Thanks, John, for your presentation. Andrew Peterson from University of South Australia. I just had a question, John, about the first part of the conclusion and whether the statement about students not seeing themselves as disadvantaged, is that, is that a normative statement that they shouldn't see themselves as poorly disadvantaged?